more stuff makes you happier, right? My three-year-old grandson thinks that. He hoards his cars and defends them against all would-be friends. But you've probably grown a bit sceptical about that link between stuff and happiness. You've figured out that more stuff doesn't necessarily make you happier. But for whatever reason, you and I don't live like we know this. We still pursue that false belief that the more we have, the happier we'll be. If more stuff really won't make us happier, what will? Stick around and let's find out together. Did you grow up with the same message I did? Work hard at school, get good grades, find that well-paid job, work long hours so you get promotion, so you can afford a nice house, a high-end car, fancy holidays, private health care and a retirement fund. I didn't question it. I wonder if you got that message or some version of it too. You may even have heard a version in church, the work ethic is often linked with blessing and prosperity in the older part of the Bible. You and I have been taught the equation observable success plus money equals the good life. The theory is that money and stuff, rewards for your hard work, a higher standard of living, is what makes you comfortable and happy. Now you may have amended that theory over the years to say it's overall quality of life that's important, not just money. So you're looking for job satisfaction as well as salary. Your goal is a good work-life balance. You make sure you've got time and funds for a round of golf, for the gym or a night out. You apply a good work ethic so you can enjoy whatever it is you're passionate about at the weekend. You might be at the start of that journey, getting that qualification, or further down the road, putting in the hours and enjoying the rewards. But the unwritten theory is that the more you have, the happier you'll be. How is that going for you? Has your investment in stuff over the years, stuff that improves your quality of life, has it paid off in terms of improved happiness? As life goes on, perhaps you realise the more stuff you have, the more you want. There's always the latest model, the next upgrade or your neighbour's inflatable hot tub. Even worse, you realise that no amount of money or stuff can protect you from life's curveballs. Living in the UK, I felt immune from epidemics due to the UK's relative wealth, our NHS and 21st century medical advances. But we've learned from COVID that our bank balance, our healthcare plan are no protection against the global pandemic and our confidence is shaken. Doesn't money and stuff guarantee our happiness? Isn't hard work and success supposed to protect us from the unexpected and ensure we enjoy a good life? If you've been asking yourself these questions, if you've grown skeptical about those life lessons you learned in school, it might surprise you to know that the writer of an ancient book called Ecclesiastes shared your skepticism. Whatever your views on Christianity, I think you'll find this old sceptic's wisdom rings true. He's disillusioned. He's not afraid to question what life is all about. In fact, we'll call him the sceptic. In chapter 2 of his book, he shares his own life experience. He worked hard, built houses for himself, planted vineyards, gardens and orchards. He was hugely successful with the status symbols of the day. Servants, animals, silver and gold, even a harem and his own band. He enjoyed his work and its rewards. He made time for leisure and pleasure. Even by today's standards, he had it all. But as this sceptic looked back on his life, perhaps it's a midlife crisis, he realised that everything was like smoke, vanishes quickly and spitting into the wind. It's pointless. He enjoyed the highest quality of life you and I can imagine, and yet he felt unfulfilled. Everything was meaningless. He looked back on a life of investing in stuff, a successful life, and he wondered, what's it all about? Have you ever felt like that? The sceptic didn't wish he'd been stupid and lazy. He didn't regret the work, but he wondered where being smart had got him. Will anything last? How does it all end? One fate for all and that's it. The smart and the stupid both disappear out of sight. In a day or two, they're both forgotten. Yes, both the smart and the stupid die and that's it. He's feeling mortal, and we've all felt vulnerable recently. No one mentioned in school about trouble being part of life. There were no lessons about failure or coping with disaster. 
We were taught to succeed. But disappointment and adversity fall on the best of us. And there's one certainty at the end. Whether we're a success or a failure on this earth, we all face death. And so the sceptic had a moment of despair. I hated everything I had accomplished and accumulated on this earth. I can't take it with me. No, I have to leave it to whoever comes after me, whether they're worthy or worth less. What's the point of working your fingers to the bone if you hand over what you work for to someone who never lifted a finger for it? So what do you get from a life of hard labour? Pain and grief from dawn to dusk. Nothing but smoke. The sceptic is not just having a bad day. This is a crisis. What's the point of existing? What meaning does life have? And maybe you felt the same at some point recently. Life has changed so much that we're all re-evaluating what's important. We're questioning how we spend our most precious commodity, our time. What is your life and mine all about? The sceptic wasn't the only one to ask this question. Centuries later, Jesus in the first century made the same point. Dr Luke, a historian, records someone asking Jesus to persuade his brother to share his inheritance. Someone else who thinks stuff will make him happy. Jesus warned him not to be greedy because life is not defined by what you have, even when you have a lot. And then Jesus told a story, and you can find it in chapter 12 of Luke's book, about a rich man who grew such a good crop, it couldn't fit in his barn. This is what I'll do, he said. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I'll store my grain and my goods, and I'll say to myself, you've plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. He's made it. Success. His hard work has paid off. He can retire in comfort. But the story has a surprise ending. The rich farmer didn't have long to enjoy his wealth. God said to him, you fool, tonight you die and your barn full of goods, who gets it? That's what happens when you fill your barn with self and not with God. So what did the sceptic and the rich farmer have in common? They're both successful, both invested their lives in stuff, in their own quality of life. Both believed the more you have, the happier you'll be. But did they experience the happiness they craved? The farmer died too young to enjoy the wealth he worked so hard for. The sceptic ended up hating his achievements and possessions because stuff wears out, becomes obsolete or unfashionable. Stuff can't protect us from tragedy. They seem to have it all, but what's missing from their lives? The rich farmer had no one to share his stuff with or leave his wealth to, no heir to inherit. No one else even got a mention in his story because it's all about him. How about the sceptic? Well, there are other people in his story. He acquired servants, musicians and his harem. To him, people seem to be objects to be acquired to improve his own quality of life. Neither of them invested in relationships. So is there an alternative life? A life that doesn't revolve around money and stuff? A life that will have an impact even once we're gone? What did Jesus think about this? One of the greatest influencers of all time, despite his short life. It's fascinating to get Jesus' take on this, even if you're not a follower. The way he lived and taught leave us in no doubt what he considers a good life. When asked which of God's commands is the most important, his answer was clear. Love God with all your passion and prayer and intelligence. And love others as well as you love yourself. Love is what matters. Our relationship with the God who lovingly made us and our relationship with those around us are what truly matter. Recent events have shown that when tragedy strikes our community or our family, the most important thing is our faith in God. He walks with us through those dark times when we feel isolated and he gives us hope that stretches beyond the grave. But also the people in our lives who help carry us through. We've realised how important people are because we've been separated from them. And that's not just family. We've missed friends and acquaintances, different depths of relationships, all of which we now realise matter a lot. So it's not what we have in life, but who we have in our life 
that matters. This is not new. We're all nodding. But I wonder if our schedule, the way we invest our time, reflects the importance of the people we say we love, the people we realise we need. Or is our diary structured around earning money, spending it in our own hobbies, so that we have little time to invest in the people around us? Well, it depends on your stage of life, but it takes time to invest in your marriage, your children, your wider family and friends. If we're running from one thing to another with no gaps in our diary, there's no time to be loving to the people around us on the way. We're too stressed and there's no time to pray. Love is spelt T-I-M-E. But what is it about our stuff that seems to get in the way of our love? John Mark Comer said, Every single thing you buy costs you not only money, but also time. Stuff must be cleaned, charged, updated, serviced, repaired and stored. More stuff equals more work, more stress, possibly more debt and less time to invest in relationships. Keeping your home Instagrammable or renovating that old car may sound like a good idea, but may not be worth the cost in terms of your time. I wonder if you look back to pre-COVID days and realise you were prioritising money and stuff, your own quality of life, instead of the quality of your love. If we say we love God, that means we'll choose to spend time with him, reordering our life so there's space for more than those emergency prayers. Space to get to know him and his character better. Loving your family may mean saying no to work that steals too much of your time, the promotion which would send you around the world, leaving a young family behind, or taking on that extra project that would leave you stressed. Love may mean shelving your plans to upgrade your car or your kitchen. Love may mean giving up some of your leisure time to visit the lonely or to care for the neighbour's kids or to volunteer. Making sure your kids have the latest technology is much less important than spending quality time with them. Love is a time commitment. What would it mean to restructure your life and your schedule to prioritise loving God and loving others? As our lives return to a work-pressured, social media-connected whirl of children's activities and parties or pent-up shopping needs or house renovation projects or leisure pursuits or travel, we have a unique opportunity now to reprioritize our lives and our schedules around what matters the most. Our investment in people, the time we take pouring into them, will last way beyond our investment in stuff. What will my grandchildren remember about me? The newly decorated bathroom and the stripy lawn? I don't think so. They'll remember whether I was too busy to enjoy spending time with them to build a tower, kick a football around or read a Bible story as if I believe it. 100 years from now, the only thing that will matter about the life you got to live here on earth is who and what you loved the most. How you and I love our spouse, our children, our neighbour, our wider family, even our acquaintances, how we show love by sharing our stuff with others, will last way beyond our physical legacy. Our investment in people, not our investment in stuff, will impact generations to come because love impacts lives. What if Jesus was right when he said, your life is not defined by what you have? If we say we want to follow Jesus, to be like him, why do we deliberately live in a way that he wouldn't? Jesus focused on who over what. He focused on living rather than acquiring. If we are Jesus followers, that's what we've signed up for. And if we're not Jesus followers, living like this will probably have a positive impact on our sense of well-being and quality of life. We know the stuff we think will make us happy won't. So why not try a different way? Imagine for a moment a community that moved from maximising their own quality of life to maximising their quality of love. Some of that extra stuff that needs cleaning and fixing and organising, stuff that adds stress to life, could be shared or given away. Space could be made in our lives to connect, to really listen and look for ways to help one another. Children would feel loved and valued instead of feeling rushed. Families would be strengthened, the lonely 
and the marginalised would feel included. It's not what we have in life, but who we have in our life that matters. How will you spend your life? Investing in stuff or investing in people?